everybody. In this video, we're going to look at entropy changes for physical processes. And the physical process that we're going to focus on is phase changes and temperature changes. We're going to take a piece of ice and add some heat to heat up the ice. And then we're going to melt the ice. And then we're going to heat up the water. And then we're going to evaporate the water and then finally heat up the steam. So this process, if we're going to calculate the change in entropy for all of these steps, we're going to need the equations that are on this page. And for the heating steps, we'll use these equations right here. It says that the change in entropy is equal to the number of moles times the specific heat capacity times the natural log of the final temperature over the initial temperature. Now, as you may recall, heating can occur at either constant pressure or constant volume. If the container is rigid and will not expand or contract, then the heating will occur at constant volume. If the container can move or if it's just under open to the atmosphere, then it will be a constant pressure process. So those equations will be used for the heating steps where all we need to know is the moles, the specific heat capacity, which will be a constant that's given, and the initial temperature and the final temperature. And then when the water reaches the point of the phase changes, either the melting of the ice or the evaporation of the water, then we will use this equation up here. This says that the change in entropy of the system is equal to the heat transfer during a reversible process divided by that temperature. Well, we know that phase changes are reversible and they are isothermal, uh, meaning they happen at one temperature, so the temperature is not changing, constant temperature. And if they happen slow enough, they occur in a reversible manner where there is an equilibrium between both phases. So when ice is melting, there's both a combination of liquid water and solid water touching each other. So we can say that that process is reversible. Thus, the change in entropy for a phase change is given by the change in enthalpy associated with that phase change uh, divided by the temperature of that phase change. Now, before we go on to solving the problem, let's just take a look at what we mean by this heating process and phase change process for water. So this is a heating curve for water, which shows you that if you start out with ice down here at the origin and you add heat over a certain amount of time, so this can, instead of time could be energy added, we will start to heat the ice according to some slope, which will be given by its specific heat capacity. Once we've reached the phase change temperature for ice to water, the melting of ice, the temperature stays constant until all the ice is melted. All the energy goes into melting the ice and not raising the temperature of the water. Then once all the ice is melted, the water will begin to be heated according to a curve of different slope because there's a different specific heat capacity of liquid water compared to ice until we get to the boiling point of water, in which case the evaporation will occur and the temperature will remain constant during that phase change process. Notice that during the phase change, the energy that goes in from the surroundings, from the heat source, has to uh, make up the delta H of vaporization. So the delta H of vaporization will tell you how much energy is needed to evaporate one mole of water. And similarly for delta H of fusion, it will tell you how much energy is required to evaporate one mole of water. Now notice that the lengths of these curves, of these lines here, are indicative of the relative magnitudes of delta H of vaporization and delta H of fusion. We'll explain more about that later. And then finally, we're heating steam according to a curve of a different slope than that of liquid water, um, dependent on the specific heat capacity of steam, which is different than that of water. So here is the problem that we are going to work on. And it's number 32 from chapter 10 out of the textbook. And it says a sample of ice weighing 18.02 grams, that happens to be one mole of water, initially at minus 30 degrees C, is heated to 140 degrees C at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. Calculate Q, 
W, delta E, delta H, and delta S for this process. The molar heat capacities for solid, liquid, and gaseous water are given, and they're assumed to be temperature independent, and the enthalpies of fusion and vaporization are also given. Assume ideal gas behavior. Here we have a hot plate in the lab, and uh, we're going to take a piece of ice and put it on the hot plate. So now it's heating up the ice and rapidly melting the ice, reaching its fusion temperature. And then it's heating the water, and then rapidly heating the water, and then going up to its boiling temperature and evaporating as steam. So there's a, many different processes, at least five processes that were occurring there. Now let's do it in a little more dramatic fashion. Uh, just pour the whole dang beaker on the hot plate and we can start to see copious quantities of steam being released. Alright, so now we're going to solve a problem where we will consider the heating of water and um, this is going to be energy going this way and um, this is going to be temperature going up like this and we're going to start at zero and actually let's say, call this minus uh, 30. Okay, we're going to go all the way up to plus 140 and uh, we're going to heat some ice. We're going to melt that ice. We're going to heat the water. We're going to evaporate that water. And finally, we're going to heat the steam. So this domain here is the water. This is the steam. And this is the ice down here. The flat section refers to delta H of fusion. And the flat section here refers to delta H of vaporization. Okay, so here's the details. 18.02 grams of H2O, one mole. Okay, keep it simple. And it starts out at minus 30 degrees C. The first step is gonna go to zero degrees C. And then it's gonna go from zero to 100 degrees C. And then it's gonna go from 100 to 140 degrees C. Um, we have some constants we have to consider. This specific heat capacity, this is all done at constant pressure as you saw in the video. So CP 37.5 and um, this is for ice. CP of water is 75.3 and CP steam is 36.4 and these are all joules per mole K. All right, so step one, heat ice. And let's just focus on the entropy change for that. So delta S1 is going to be given by N CP LN T2 over T1. And that equals 1 mole times 37.5 joule per mole K times LN. And here we need to be in Kelvin, so that is going to be uh, 273 over 243. Okay, that's zero degrees Celsius on top and minus 30 Celsius on the bottom. So now delta S1, if you do all that math, equals 4.4 .4 joule per K. And that's the units on entropy change is energy per temperature. All right, let's see if we can squeeze step two on here. This is going to be melt the ice. And that's going to be at zero degrees C. So the 
equation here is delta S2 equals delta H of fusion over T. Delta H of fusion um, was supposed to have been given to you in the initial constants. I'll give it to you now. That is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. And we better convert that into joules times 1,000 joule per kilojoule. And that's divided by the temperature of the phase change, which is 273K. And so this becomes equal to 22.0 joule per K. All right, now we'll go on to the next one. Step three. All right, this is heat water from zero degrees C to 100 degrees C. All right, and so now this is going to be um, another heating step. So that's delta S3 equals uh, NCP ln T2 over T1. That equals one mole. Now we have a different C quantity. That was 75.3 joule per mole K. And finally, ln of 373 divided by 273. And so when we work that out, delta S3 equals 23.5 joule per K. All right, step four. We are going to evaporate the water. And um, this will be uh, given, once again, like the melting of ice, delta S4 is going to be equal to delta H of vaporization over the temperature. And the delta H of vaporization uh, will be given to you, and that is uh, 40.7 kilojoules per mole, and we'll multiply that by 1,000 joule per kilojoule, and we'll divide all this by the temperature of the vaporization, which is 100 degrees C, and that is 373K, and now we can see that the delta S of vaporization now equals 109.1 joule per K. All right, so now we have steam. The last step is to heat the steam. Step five, heat steam from 100 degrees to 140 degrees. And so once again, simple heating step. It's gonna be equal to N Cp ln of T2 over T1. That's gonna be one mole. And the specific heat capacity of steam is, looking for it, looking for it. Okay, 36.4 joule mole K and LN of 140, which is 413 in Kelvin. Sorry about that three there. Let's just redo that. 413 over 373. Okay, and so we do the math here. And we get delta S5 equals 3.7 joule per K. So now delta S total of all five steps is going to be equal to the first step, which was 4.4 joule per K, plus the second step which was 22.0 joule per K, plus the third step, which was 
3.5 joule per K plus the fourth step, which was 109.1 joule per K plus the fifth step, which was 3.7 joule per K for a grand total of 162.7 joule per K. Now notice the relative values of these. The largest value is this guy right here. That is delta S of vaporization. That represents the largest increase in entropy of all these processes because of the extreme randomness in forming a gas relative to the liquid. Now the lowest value of all these is this guy right here. And that is the entropy involved in heating steam. So if you think about the randomness argument, steam is already really random. 100 degree steam is really random and 140 degree steam is just not that much more random. So there you have it. It's a pretty long problem, but if you just follow each of these steps and break it down, I'm sure you'll have no trouble at all.